Alcohol did for me what I could not do for myself. When I was drunk, I could actually express myself. You know, I could talk. You know, I, I didn't isolate anymore. You know, so alcohol helped me in that regard. And, and, and you know, they say, uh, alcoholics are the last people to know that they have a problem. I mean, people always told me, you know what, you need to stop. You know, but I couldn't see why I should stop taking my solution. You know, it didn't make sense to me when people said I had to stop drinking. You got to a point where I never loved the reflection I got from the mirror. I had lost myself completely. I don't know if you have ever been in a journey where you try to find yourself, but in the process you get lost. And that was my life. And I guess one of the things that propelled me to change was having to witness the pain, you know, in my family. I took a smile out of my mother's face and I put it on the shipping screen. You know, I, I took their joy, I took their serenity. I never stole only tangible stuff, but I stole their peace. I remember there was a time my sister said to me, Manda, why do you know you have done so much pain and you have inflicted so much pain in my parents, and yet you don't have the audacity to die. Why don't you just die so that I could have my family back? Now I realize she was not saying that out of the hatred, you know, but it was because of the pain that I put that through. Alcohol affected me in a way that when it comes to Indabazum Seven, everybody knew that on Mondays I won't pitch up. And if I do pitch up on Tuesday, I come with that uh, sick note, you know. Fridays, Umanda won't pitch up, you know. Payday, I won't be there, you know. And, and also my productivity, I wasn't productive anymore, uh, you know. And, and, and then I knew that it was just a matter of time before I get fired. My first born, Usile, and she was born 2014, right? And that's the year where I decided to go to rehab. It was in that moment that something happened. The way she looked at me, she said so much. It's like she was looking at me like, yo, 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 is he going to be my dad? Who you baba, you know? And I remember from that moment onwards, I knew I had to change. It's not described by the things that are tangible, but a man is described by how he conducts himself. Man, this should be our question. Sometimes. One alcoholic talking to another in a therapy, don't know, with a therapeutic value, you know. So I realized that maybe now I can pass on the message of hope to the still suffering addicts because they will be able to identify easily. We think of the crystal meth and I now realize, Guti, I think I find my purpose when I help the next suffering addict and alcoholic. So if helping the next person is part of my purpose, then I'm loving it. I used to live and live to use. That was my life. I thought drinking and drugging was a way of living, only to find out it was a way to die. Addiction is a dependency on a mood or mind altering substance. So um, I like to break down addiction into someone relying on a behavior or a substance to help them cope and um, it becomes part of their lifestyle. There are several stages that you go through in your addiction. Addiction is progressive. It gets worse, it never gets better. But the first stage, we refer to it as a pleasure stage. And that's when they're still enjoying themselves. They haven't yet noticed um, or experienced the pain of addiction. They haven't lost a lot of things. 
they still don't have um, the, 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 the suffering that you eventually get as the years go by. And so it doesn't make sense to most of them why they should stop. If we look at way back, people were chewing tobacco and then people found cigarettes. And today, people are vaping, you know? At the end of the day, it's still about the nicotine. Way back with moonshine, you know. Uh, but as times are going, we now have you know, flavored gins and flavored vodkas, and you know, it's it, there's a hype around it, but it's still about the alcohol. We use alcohol because we want to escape what we're feeling, because we cannot handle our reality. We do not have the skills, we do not have the tools, we do not have the knowledge enough to be able to deal with life as it comes. And in order to try and cope with that, then we numb ourselves. We escape through alcohol and, and drugs. It doesn't matter what the substance is. It doesn't matter if you're addicted to alcohol, nicotine, um, crack cocaine, rich man's drug cocaine, heroin, meth, um, or nyoke. I think that people just don't know what to do. And they are experimenting. They are trying to cope. They want to get rid of a lot of stress. I think that everybody has a vice. It's helpful in the beginning, but it becomes harmful in the end. But it ends off deadly. So many people die from this disease. Once a person has a brain disease, um, they're going to persist and pursue the alcohol regardless of the consequences. And I don't think they intentionally want to hurt the child. Currently, uh, globally, over 5% of deaths are attributable to alcohol, and that translates to over 5 million deaths. Fetal alcohol syndrome, um, you can see it in a, um, in a couple of um, children when they are born. So this is when the mother drinks alcohol during pregnancy. If the mother doesn't drink while she's pregnant, there's no possibility of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders developing. The difficulty is that even at two drinks a week, so if you're in a relationship and you fall pregnant and you as the female have two drinks a week in a social manner and you discover four or six weeks later that you're pregnant, that baby could have attention deficit, it could have um, those kind of milder problems. We are the worst in the world. We have 111 babies born per 1,000 have FASD. The norm, the average, is seven babies per 1,000. So we're 14 times worse than the rest of the world. That affects about 6% of the population. Some communities in the Western Cape have up to 29%, a third of the children are born with some sort of FASD. So th this is a major 
problem that we're going to continue to reap the rewards of across the decades to come. This is a problem. How we see that babies are born with um, um, fetal alcohol syndrome is sort of like in their facial structure. Smaller eyes, smaller ears, a bit of a dip in the nose, thin uh, lips, their heads are smaller. It's distinct features. The things that we don't see is how their organs haven't developed properly. What we don't see is mental disorders. So some of these kids are born with learning disabilities. They are born with the chance of growing into having bipolar, which is a mood disease, um, growing into having ADHD and, and so forth. And the only way that you would know um, that this baby has fetal alcohol syndrome disease is once they're born. Not only this, but then um, the child will actually need to be in a hospital for longer and get treatment for longer because it's likely will have withdrawal symptoms because of the mother um, having alcohol while um, she was pregnant. Sometimes it's just like an adult, that they will need it, otherwise they will cry, they will feel cranky, they will um, act out, all because of this. So we have a theory called the first thousand days. So that's from conception until two years of age. And in those two years um, and from conception, it actually is such a, a vital stage for the baby's brain development that it can actually have later on other mental disorders, especially personality disorders. But again, once a person has a brain disease, um, they're going to persist and pursue the alcohol regardless of the consequences. And I don't think they intentionally want to hurt the child. I tried to fall pregnant and I couldn't fall pregnant. We decided to adopt. Keegan was in a place of safety at the time and just through people I know, I found out about Keegan. Uh, we went to see him on a Sunday, fell in love with him and two months later we adopted him. At the time of adoption, we didn't know all the background about Keegan. We knew he was born with a cleft palate and a cleft lip. He also was born with two thumbs on one hand. What would you like in the sandwich? Just butter, please. What about honey? Because Keegan was my first child, I didn't have any reference. So I didn't know what was a normal baby like and how different Keegan was. So we just took all the punches that came to us in our stride. From the time that Keegan was little, as soon as he could start walking, he never walked, he ran. He was a very busy child, climbing on stuff. He was busy. He could never sit and build a puzzle or color in or anything like that. But we didn't know anything. So when he got to the age of five, he went to a little preschool and he did some naughty stuff there, like put prit on his friends' chairs because in his mind they're going to be stuck to their chairs. And when he had to do a task, he would go outside and run around. At the age of five, he was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, when he had to go to grade one, he wasn't school ready. So we had him tested again and they said he needs a remedial school. And we followed the process until he finished primary school with great difficulty. And in that couple of years that we were in a remedial school, all different things came out like global delay, um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, all those things. So it was the school that sort of guided us and helped us and, and sort of showed us the way. It was an extremely tough journey. 
Um, Keegan had 23 operations up to date and he's only 17 years old. Emotionally, it's very draining to see your little baby um, always in hospitals, in and out, stitches, bleeding. It, it was emotionally very draining. Giving up wasn't an option for me. Giving up wasn't in my thoughts. I was just so blessed to have a baby. All I wanted was a baby. So the fact that I had to go through all these operations and all these things, it didn't really matter. But it's tough. And every time you go into a principal's office where there's teachers and therapists and they, they tell you more stuff about your child, your child can't do this, your child can't do that, it's heartbreaking, not just for us as parents, but for my child. Um, we think life is tough as it is. To have all these things on top of it, it's just, it's hard. It's a very, very hard journey. If you limit the number of, uh, you know, alcohol outlets, you tend to be able to impact drink people's drinking patterns. that we've got one of the highest rates of femicide, one of the highest rates of gender-based violence, intimate partner violence. We also know that many of those are related to alcohol. So we know that up to about 60% of um, intimate partner violence incidents in South Africa, one or both parties have, were under the influence of alcohol. But from a health perspective as well, we know that alcohol causes cancers. We know that alcohol causes fetal alcohol syndrome. So there's a lot of, again, you know, health related uh, issues relating to alcohol. The data tells us that unless we intervene, uh, we will continue to have very high alcohol attributable death rates. And we know that currently, uh, globally, over 5% of deaths are attributable to alcohol, and that translates to over 5 million deaths. So you can imagine we're saying globally over 5 million deaths can be attributable to alcohol. You know that in our townships, at every turn, there's a, a shabin, there's a a tavern and so we know that um, you know we've got evidence that if you limit the number of uh, you know alcohol outlets you tend to be able to impact drink people's drinking patterns we also know that two of uh, South Africa's cities uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town have got one of the cheapest beer in the world so they're in like the top 10 so again, you know, price has been used uh, globally as a, as, as, as a way of reducing heavy episodic drinking. The alcohol amendment uh, uh, bill, which has been sitting in parliament um, for years now, and we've been trying to uh, have it passed, but without success. I mean, we are not sure what's happening. In fact, there hasn't been any clarity from government on what's happening. I do 
you think the campaigns work for Arrive Alive and um, all of those um, do not drink and drive? And um, I think it's good, but um, I do think that's kind of now just like trying to stop the symptoms of the actual cause. Um, so I do think, yes, it must come from if we have more jobs in South Africa, if, um, if people can see that they can be festive and happy um, without using alcohol, I do think it must start within the family and from polit um, politics and um, downwards from government to schools to the actual kids in their houses that people can see, hey, life can be a lot of fun. And then if all these systems work together, we can definitely try to curb it. But it's still going to be a person's choice at the end of the day. Even if we ban alcohol, like during COVID lockdown, people will still find a way if they want to. So I do think it might still be a long term. Trying to protect our children from alcohol abuse would really be a, a cultural, societal and a family responsibility. If, if each family took responsibility for um, not abusing alcohol as adults, it's going to set an example. It's so much easier for me to get drunk if my dad gets drunk. So if, if the father and the mother are responsible, productive, tax-paying members of society and they function well, there's a much higher chance that those kids have the chance of not becoming an alcoholic. Mm -hmm.